Well, good morning. It's good to be here with you today. Hey, I have to say this. You know, there are times I've been known to take this opportunity to share what I call an interesting story about one of my children. My children say they're embarrassing stories. So the temptation is always there to be able to, to do that. But today, I thought I would share one about myself. Just, just to you know, give them a break. And so here it is. I feel like you know, I can share this now uh, with you guys. Hello, my name's Daniel, and I have a slight problem. They would call it an obsession. Uh, my children would with with Broadway musicals. <laughs> you can laugh. It's okay. You know, I love country music, I do. I mean, Willie and Merle and Waylon and all of it. I mean, I, I, I love that music, but there's something about Broadway musicals. Sometimes I, I get a little excited about them. My children would tell you stories if you ask that. I, I actually wear them out with them, just trying to sing the songs. I, I don't know what my problem is, but it's, it's there, okay? That's just something about me. You now know one of those Broadway musicals that I got a little excited, maybe slightly obsessed with not too long ago, was one that's been very popular for a while now, and that was Hamilton. With the story of Alexander Hamilton during the Revolutionary War time period. And, and in that musical, um, there's a character that King George shows up from time to time throughout the story. And at one moment, right after the Battle of Yorktown, when, when the English have surrendered to General Washington, and they're getting ready to figure out how they start their country, King George shows up on stage, and he starts singing a song, and he says this line, what comes next? And he asks him, he goes, hey, you've been freed, but hey, do you know what to do now? But that idea, what comes next? You know, that's kind of where we have been for the spring and summer. Let me just remind you of the journey that we've been on. Back in the spring, we started looking at the work of the Holy Spirit and how the Spirit that's in us, the Bible says, can, can accomplish greater things than even Jesus beside us. We looked at his work. We took some time. We said, we want you to, to lean into this and, and to take a spiritual gifts assessment to just really identify where you've been gifted and where your passions are and, and where your experiences have brought you to this place to use the gifts that the Holy Spirit has given you and empowered you to use to make an impact for Christ. And then over the summer, we have looked at the fruit of the Spirit and how that Holy Spirit that's in us, how, it should, how he should manifest himself in our everyday life. So, so we've been on this, on this journey, but now we're kind of coming to this point where we need to say, so what's next? Why have we been doing this? So, so it's really, we're kind of at an intersection here where we've got a couple of choices. Do we take this journey this understanding of just how incredible it is that you and I, as followers of Jesus, have the Holy Spirit within us. Do we just file that away as good information and go on about our lives without any real disruption? Or do we, do we lean into this and allow this truth to transform how we live? So that's a question for you and I to answer. What's next? What's next for us in our walk with the Lord? And maybe we need to say, why is what's next what's next? Why are we going to make that choice? Well, this morning, we're gonna look at a passage of scripture in the book of Deuteronomy. So if you've got your Bible, if you've got a copy of God's word, open it up to Deuteronomy chapter six. If you don't have a Bible, look in the pew rack in front of you. There is one there. And if you don't have a Bible, that is now yours. Take that. That is a gift from us to you. We want you to read it. We want you to use it. So take that with you. But in Deuteronomy chapter six, the children of Israel are really faced with a very similar question to the one that I just posed for you and I this morning. What's next? You see, they are at a major crossroads in this moment. 
They are about to enter into the promised land. They have spent 40 years in the wilderness. Prior to that, they were slaves in Egypt. And they say they saw God deliver them from the hands of Pharaoh. They spent 40 years in the wilderness. But now it's getting ready to get real. There's going to be a leadership transition for them. Moses is stepping down. Joshua is taking over. There's getting ready to be some geographical change. They've been wandering just as nomads in the wilderness for 40 years. Now they're getting ready to cross the Jordan River and go into and take possession of the promised land. There's also a very, there's a cultural transition that's taking place right now too. At this point, Everyone over the age of 20, when they came out of Egypt, has now died off in the wilderness. So there is a brand new generation that is going to be going in to the promised land. So there is a major shift that's happened. And in Deuteronomy 6, Moses addresses the people with a message from God. And here's what he says. He's basically saying, listen, if you want to not only take possession of the land that God has given you, but if you want to actually thrive in the land, here is what should come next for you. So that kind of sets up where we are. So look with me in Deuteronomy chapter six. We're gonna start reading in verse four. We're gonna look at verse four and five. And this passage of scripture is known in Judaism as the Shema. It is a prayer. It is the first part of a prayer that the Jewish people have prayed for thousands of years now. Every day, they pray this prayer. And it goes like this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Hear, O Israel. We're gonna take a few minutes this morning. Some of you may know this passage of scripture. You may have heard it and say, that sounds familiar. I've heard that quoted. I've heard those words before. Some of you may have those words memorized. Some of you here today may have, this may be the first time you've ever heard those words. And guess what? Any of those places where you find yourself are absolutely okay because today we're gonna unpack that passage by looking at just some really important words in the Shema, in this prayer in this word that God gave Moses to give to the people to say, this is what I have for you. This is how you should live as you go into the promised land. We're gonna look at some of these words and unpack this together because here's, here's what I know. I believe what we'll learn from this passage today has tremendous application for you and I to be able to really understand why it's so important that we pause and ask ourselves, What's next? What do we do with this understanding that we have been gifted by the Holy Spirit to live on purpose and on mission for Jesus Christ? So look with me, if you will. The first word I want you to see is the word here. The word here. In Hebrew, this word is Shema. So this is where the prayer gets its name, is from this word right here. And, and the word simply means to listen. But I think it's very interesting to know that in Hebrew, there is not a separate word for listen and obey. They have one word. Do you see the importance of that there? He says, listen, if you are truly listening to someone who is in authority over you, if you're truly listening to someone that's speaking, you won't just hear words, but you will respond. You will obey. It carries this idea of paying attention to, to focus on and to respond to what you hear. See, that is why in Isaiah chapter six, when Isaiah hears the voice of God calling him to go and take the message that God has for the people, he says, they're going to hear, but they're not really gonna listen. And so it's, it's this idea, it's really incompatible that, that if we really truly understand and listen, that we won't obey. And so at the very beginning of this, God's message to the people is listen and obey what I'm getting ready to tell you. 
And what is it he's going to tell them? The next word I want you to see, it says, it's the who's telling them this. It's the word Lord there in all capital letters. This word is used many, many times throughout the Old Testament. And every time you see the Lord in all caps, it refers to God's divine name, his personal name. The first time we see this name is at the burning bush with Moses, where where Moses is told to go to the Pharaoh and say, let my people go. And Moses says, who am I to say is sending me? And he says, I am is sending you. It's that is God's name. That is his personal name. It is his name that sets him apart. He is the God who was, who is, and who will forever be. Every time you see Lord like that, it is, it is distinct. He's not like all the other gods, all the gods of the Egyptians and the pagan tribes and nations that Israel encountered. No, he is distinct. He is the one and only true God. That is who is speaking. And that's important for us to understand. That was important for the Israelites to understand as they're getting ready to go into the land. He says, listen and obey the Lord. The God who is personal to you, the one who has delivered you, the one whose mighty hand brought you out of slavery and is taking you into and giving you possession of the promised land, that is who is speaking. That is who you are to listen and pay attention and respond to. Now, what does the Lord say that they should do? Look at the next word there that's highlighted. He says, you should love Now, this is a fascinating word used for love in Hebrew, and it is the word ahava. It's this idea of affection and care. You will see it used many times in the Old Testament. It is that idea that I care deeply about someone. It is the idea of affection. There are other words used in the Hebrew for romantic love. But in Hebrew, when this word is used, ahava, it is this idea that there is great care and affection for someone, but it is validated by action. It's not just an emotion. It's not just a feeling. It's an action. I want you to see another place it's used. Flip over one page back in Deuteronomy chapter four. Look at verse 37. And it says, and because he, Ahava, He loved your fathers and chose their offspring after them. Look at what he did because he loved them. He brought you out of Egypt with his own presence by his great power. So ahava is this idea. It's an idea of action. It is this idea that if I care for you, I am going to demonstrate that in what I do. And look at what Israel is called to do. They are called in this passage to imitate the love that they have seen expressed by Yahweh back to him. Yahweh has says, I love you. And I've demonstrated my love for you by delivering you from the hands of Pharaoh, by being faithful to the covenant that I made to Abraham to make you a great nation. I have been faithful and I have demonstrated my faithfulness and my love to you by bringing you to this moment. And I'm going to give you this promised land and I have made you my people. And he says, I want you to reflect, to imitate my ahava back to me by your actions, by your response to who I am. That is the call of this passage. Now, in just a couple of moments, we are gonna spend the time we have left unpacking just specific ways that God says they are to show Ahava back to God in the way that they live. But this morning, we have the privilege as Pastor Jason said just a few moments ago, to take the Lord's Supper together. And so just to prepare our hearts for that time, I want us to look at some passages of Scripture. Look at the screens, if you will. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. It says this, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses. Look at the action that validates the affection. 
He made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Romans 5, verse 6 through 8. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a good person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. First John chapter three and verse 16, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. And just a chapter over in 1 John 4, 9, it says this, in this the love of God was made manifest among us. This is how we see it. This is how we know it, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Do you see it? Do you see the love of God that was demonstrated in the Old Testament as Yahweh brought the people out of slavery and took them into the promised land? But then do you see in the New Testament how the love of Jesus Christ laid down his life to free us from sin. There's a call for us to respond to that. And one of the ways we have to do that is by coming around the Lord's table. So right now our deacons are gonna be moving through the aisles. If as you came in, you did not get one of the sets of the elements for the Lord's Supper, just slip your hand up. And they will make sure that you get one of these. If you did get one, go ahead and get it out and be ready. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that it calls us as followers of Jesus to remember Christ's death, to respond to his love that he demonstrated, his substitutionary atonement, his ahava. We are to respond to that by partaking of the Lord's Supper. In verse 26 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says this, for as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. When we pause right now and we reflect by taking the bread, we remember his sacrifice for us, his body that was broken, his great love that was demonstrated by taking our sin upon himself as he went to the cross. Lord Jesus, we thank you this morning for your body that was broken, for how you demonstrated your love through action. You did not just say you loved us. You showed it by laying down your life. So we pause and we thank you for that this morning. Lord Jesus, for your body that was broken. Would you take the bread with me? But not only was the body of our Lord Jesus pierced, beaten for us, taking our sin upon himself. But scripture tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And so the perfect blood of the Lord Jesus Christ was shed up on the cross for you and I in the greatest demonstration of love, of ahava, that the world has ever seen. And, and we just read, Scripture tells us, by this, we know what love is. Would you take the cup with me? Father, we thank you that you did not spare your only son, but your word tells us that you gave him up for us to pay our ransom to be our substitute, to shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sin. 
God, may we never grow callous to the beautiful message of love that we see in the gospel. But God, may it, may it just penetrate deep into our hearts and cause us to respond with our lives to the love that we have received from you. In Jesus' name, would you take the cup with me? Now let's continue this morning. Let's look at these next few words in this text right here. Look at the next one. It says, you shall, hear, O Israel, you shall love the Lord your God. Look at how it says we are to love him with all your heart. This is the word lev in Hebrew. Now the Hebrew did not have a different word for heart and brain. There is no word for brain in the Hebrew language because here's what they believed. They believed that the heart was the source of emotion and discernment and wisdom and intellect. They believed it was in the heart that those things came from. It's how we show joy and sorrow. It's how we experienced fear. We would say that by this, they're saying the heart is the source of our will and our affections. It was central to loving God. You see, that is why as you read through the Old Testament, you see things like this. You see Moses in Deuteronomy saying that the people must allow God to circumcise their hearts if they were truly going to live as his covenant people. You see David in the Psalms say, create in me, Lord, a clean heart. Jeremiah, when he looks at the wickedness of the people and how they have just wandered far away from God, the prophet weeps and he says that the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? The prophet Ezekiel prays and says, God, give us a heart of flesh instead of a heart of stone. You see this understanding here that it is from the heart that we are able to express our love for God. It is how we are. We use our will and our affections and our mind to respond to him. So he says, if you are going to hear, O Israel, the Lord, your God is one, and you should love the Lord, your God, with all your heart. That is your mind. That's your will. That's your emotions. That's your affections. All the things that make you, you. He says, those have got to belong to him. You've got to respond with all of those. If you're truly going to love him, it involves all of those things. But he doesn't stop there, does he? He says, we love the Lord with all of our heart. What's the next word? He says, you love him with all your soul. It's the word nefesh. In Hebrew. And some may think of soul when you hear that as this, this, this invisible thing inside of you, right? There's this part of you that's unseen. And that's a bad translation of this word because that's not at all what the word nefesh means. This idea actually, nefesh, we don't have a nefesh, we are a nefesh. Nefesh simply means it's your living, breathing, physical self. It is who you are. Psalm, one, Psalm 42 verse 1 uses this word. It says, as the deer pants for the water, so my nefesh longs for you. So do you see what's happening in what this message that God is giving to the people he says, you should love the Lord with your will and your affections and your mind and your choices, but you also love him with your physical being, with everything that you are. You love the Lord and you respond. It's a love that is demonstrated and validated by action. But then there's one more word I want to draw your attention to. He says, love him with all of your heart, with all of your soul. But then it's this word, all your might or strength. It's the word meod. And this is the only time in the Old Testament that might or strength is translated meod. And here is why. 
This word in Hebrew, it's just an intensifier. It takes whatever word you are thinking of, and it just takes it to its full capacity. It intensifies it to that much. So in other words, we could say it this, love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your muchness. That would be an even better translation of this word. In the New Testament, in the Gospel of of Matthew and Mark, when Jesus is asked what is the greatest commandment, he actually quotes the Shema. And you know what word he uses there? Instead of strength or might, he uses mind. And that's an accurate translation. Because here's the idea with this word. Everything that you have, that God has given you, is an opportunity for you to express love to God. Your time, your talents, your strength, your mind, your your finances, everything about you has the ability for you to express love to God. He says, do it with all of your muchness. So what's the bottom line in this message that God had for the Israelites as they were about to cross in to the promised land? It's this. If they were going to experience the richness of living in the promised land, but not just that, but to enjoy the richness of being the people of God in the promised land, for them, their what's next was to respond to God's love that was demonstrated by his grace and his mercy And they were to express their love for him because of the love that they had received from him through their obedience and their faithfulness, through whole life devotion. Get this, not in order to be God's people, but because they already were God's people. So what do we do with this? What do we learn from this as we read the Shema? What is the application for us? How does this help us answer the question, what's next? I believe there's tremendous application for each of us personally, but also for us corporately, collectively. As the people of God, as a local church here at First Baptist Bernie, there's application for us. And I want you to look back at this text with me to see it. Look at verse four. He says, hear, O Israel, who is God addressing? It's the whole nation. You see, if we are really going to be able to answer this question, what's next? If we are going to learn from this and realize that we are called because of who he is to respond with whole life devotion to him, we have to embrace community. You see, the message to Israel is that they needed each other to be able to respond appropriately to the love that had been given to them. They needed to do this together. There was strength in the accountability. There was strength in the encouragement and the support of the entire nation. That's why he says, hear, O Israel, listen, Shema, listen and obey. We have to do this together. As the body of Christ, as those who've been adopted into God's family, through the shed blood of Jesus that we just remembered through taking of the Lord's Supper. We've been adopted into his family. We've been chosen as his children. The Bible says we have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. That is the guarantee that we belong to him. And you understand that it's incompatible with our identity as the body of Christ, as part of God's family, to think that we don't need each other to be able to express our love to God for who he is. John chapter 13, verse 35 says, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. But not only do we need each other, not only do we need to embrace community and do this together as God's people, we need to understand our identity. Look at verse five, how it starts. He says, love the Lord, your God. See, they were his people. We belong to him. We belong to him because of Jesus Christ. We are sealed, right? We don't work our way 
to God by trying to be good and by doing all of these things and by, by trying to be obedient to what scripture says. No, we respond with love because we have been sealed by the finished work of Jesus who has done it for us. So as adopted children, we express our love to God because of the love that he has demonstrated and shown to us. It's from that place of identity. They had to understand whose they were. So that's why they were told, hey, love the Lord, your God. Church, do you understand? Do you pause to remember who you belong to and that you don't keep yourself saved? It's the finished work of Jesus Christ that has accomplished that for you. We don't live our lives with wholehearted devotion in order to earn God's love. It's because we have it that we respond with this heart of thankfulness and love back to him. First John chapter four, verse 10 and 11. In this is love, not that we've loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation the substitute for our sins. Now look, he says, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. It is from that identity of who we are that we respond to who he is. And the last thing I wanna draw your attention to is the intentionality of what we're called to do. If you were to read on in the verses that follow the Shema, verses six through nine, you would see that he tells them to teach the truth of who God is. He says, teach these to your children. He says to talk of them as you walk along the way. He says to bind them on your foreheads to where they're right before your eyes every day. And he says, write them on your heart. The intentionality of this. He says, listen, if you're gonna pass on the truth of who God is to the next generation and even the current generation, if you are going to remember how great God is and if that understanding is gonna cause you to live lives that he has called you to live, he said, you have to be intentional about it. It's not gonna happen by accident. He goes on in verse 12 to give him a warning. He said, if you don't do this, he said, then you're gonna get into the land and you're gonna forget where all this blessing came from. And he says, and you're gonna forget the Lord your God. And if you know the Old Testament, you know that's exactly what they did because they quit reminding themselves. They quit teaching and talking. They let the word of God and the truth of who he is get out from before them, and they were distracted by other things. And instead of having the truth of who Yahweh was burned into their hearts, they began to have their hearts drawn to other things, and they did exactly what God warned them. They forgot. And they allowed their wholehearted devotion to be given to other things, and they paid the consequences for it. So there's a lesson there for us as the body of Christ, each of us having been gifted, each of us having been transformed, new creations in Jesus Christ, having the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit dwelling in us to give us power, strength to gift us. Are we gonna be intentional and use those gifts to make him known to those around us? Or are we gonna allow our hearts to be distracted by other things? You see, that's the question. That's the question of what's next that we see here. First Peter chapter four, verse 10, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. So where do we start? Where do we start in order to be able to take that step into what's next for us as a people, both individually but collectively? How do we really experience all that God wants to do in and through his body here at First Baptist Church? It starts with awe and wonder of who he is. Verse four, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. 
And from that perspective of awe and wonder of who he is and his greatness and his great love that he has demonstrated to us, we are, through that identity as his children, it should produce in us a loving response. And that loving response, church, hear this, it is expressed by using our lives, our gifts, our talents, our passions, by using those things to reflect who he is to those around us. As our worship team comes back out on stage, we're gonna sing one final song. And as we do, it's an opportunity for you and I to reflect on what we just heard from the word of God. There's great application. There's great lesson for us to learn from the message that Moses delivered to the people as they were going into the promised land. Are we demonstrating our love for God through whole life devotion? Or are our hearts easily distracted by other things? Pause, ask yourselves, are you expressing love for God with all of your heart and with all of your soul, with all of your might, with all of your muchness, with everything? Are, is it a whole life response? Church, we've got an incredible opportunity before us to impact the world around us with the gospel. But it starts with reflecting on that. Hear, O Israel, hear, First Baptist Church burning. The Lord, your God, is the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. He has expressed his love for you through his sacrifice, through his death, burial, and resurrection. He has rescued and redeemed you, and he has shown his love for you. How are you showing your love for him to the world around you? Are you loving him with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength? There's so much at stake, not just for us personally, although there is when we don't love God with our all. But check this out. Not only do we miss out on the blessings of walking with God when we don't do that, but the generations that follow us do as well. So as we sing, use this time to do business with God. I can't tell you what that looks like. I can just tell you simply, you've heard the word of God. How will you respond? Maybe it is just to pause and say, God, I will use my gifts. I will lean into being completely surrendered, devoted to you because of who you are and what you've done for me. I'm gonna pray and we're gonna sing. These steps are open for you to use as an altar. We'll have people down here who would love to pray with you, to talk to you more. If you need to do business with God, however he's leading, would you respond? God, we pause this morning and I pray that we would shema, that we would listen and obey your voice this morning. God, would you do what only you can do? God, would you continue to transform us and mold us and shape us more and more into the image of your son? God, so we can be a light on a hill, so that we can, God, with our whole lives, respond to your love and love you by the way we love others. Pray this in Jesus' name.